What's up, YouTube? Apple back. Sorry for the long delay. Um, I know it's been a couple weeks since I last put out a video. Um, honestly, my last video was um, less of a, uh, I, I don't know the words, but I, I didn't do as well of a job as I should have with that video. I kind of rushed it out and I apologize. I'm sure those of you who enjoy watching me still enjoyed it, but I try and do better, um, especially on this video here today. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, just, you know, um, just to throw it out there. I mean, it's 2020 is rough, uh, obviously, for pretty much all of us. And um, you have your good days, you have, and then you have your okay days. And uh, the last few weeks have been a little rough. Um, and so just haven't had a chance to get a video out. Um, I wanted to record this video yesterday, and then some work stuff happened that annoyed me and just kind of ruined it. Um, but feeling a lot better today and uh, got some good rest. Um, plan on doing some good things after the I record this video. Go hit up the gym and do some grocery shopping and then uh, come back home. And then uh, edit this video and get it up on YouTube uh, tonight. So, yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, enough about me. Um, hope all of you guys are doing okay out there. And I uh, hope you enjoy this video. So uh, today, um, I am looked up something known as the Simpsons Paradox. Um, so this is, uh, this was an interesting one to look up. It's, it was a lot more complicated than I had imagined. Um, but it's one of those paradoxes that um, is really, really interesting when you realize how it can be used to not only deceive people, but also gather better information or maybe underlying information within a certain amount of data or statistics or probability. Um, and what made me look this up? Um, honestly, I had, um, I think it was on Twitter or something. There was a news article that it posted up talking about statistics of this pandemic and how um, there was a Simpsons paradox in some of the statistics that were coming out of the CDC and that it was needed to understand what this paradox was doing in order for you to not misconstrue the information that was being presented, which let's be honest, that's a lot of that is happening right now in the world. There's a lot of information out there and we as humans who make mistakes and who oftentimes look at the world through a biased lens of some kind, and we're all guilty of this, myself included, um, we oftentimes will make assumptions about what we're seeing about our data or use some sort of confirmation bias to where we look at the data in a way that confirms what our preconceived beliefs are rather than looking at the data with no belief so that we can come up with better um, understanding of what is going on. And this is just, uh, I'll be honest, I've studied statistics and this is the problem with statistics. Statistics is an inaccurate science. Like it's, it's, that's what it's designed to do is to analyze inaccurate data or data that is, um, doesn't, isn't black or white and it's some sort of shade of gray in between. Um, so yeah, um, so let's, what is the Simpsons paradox as I just go on a tangent there? Um, so Wikipedia, which I will put up here in this corner, um, defines it as a phenomenon in probability and statistics in which a trend appears in several different groups of data, but disappears or reverses when these groups are combined. So, um, a little bit about statistics. So st statistics is the mathematical analysis of data. And um, we are surrounded by data. We are surrounded by um, all of these numbers that we can kind of just pick. And we've become very good at, at collecting data. Um, that's just... Um, it's extremely important in many of our sciences, especially medical sciences, 
social sciences, any science where there is, again, there's a gray area there. Um, what do I mean by a gray area? So physics has generally until recently, and I say recently, I mean like the last hundred years, um, recently has been very black and white in terms of what we're analyzing. Um, and the reason I say in the last hundred years it's been a little bit different is quantum mechanics has kind of thrown that whole black and white thing on its head because there are now probabilities within what happens on a quantum level. Way too advanced for this video, but um, suffice to say, here's my example. So I take an object, so this is like my little cell phone stand carrier thing that Logitech made for my, I don't know why, for my keyboard. I guess because I can hook my keyboard up to my cell phone if I really wanted to. But it's a solid, relatively heavy object. Um, it's not a feather, so it's not going to float or do anything crazy like that. Um, and so I can say with 100% certainty that if I am on planet Earth, on the surface of planet Earth, um, that as long as this planet is in existence, and this object is in existence, I guess I can say, if I take it, lift it off the ground, and drop it, whatever, um, it's going to fall at 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, and there's never going to be an instance where I do that, and it doesn't just fall out of my hands. Um, I mean, obviously, we can come up with all sorts of crazy theories as to when it wouldn't happen, but in our observable universe right this second and for the last millions of years as this planet has existed, dropping an object like that is going to yield the same result every single time. Um, and that makes physics and then it makes a lot of other sciences, especially material sciences and things like that, um, very concrete. Ha, that, you get that pun there. Material science is concrete. Yeah, anyway, um, it is black or white. This will happen when you do this. Um, humans are not so concrete. Humans are considerably more volatile, chaotic, fluid, and we've been trying extremely hard through psychology, sociology, um, medical sciences to try and get that same level of causation and correlation um, that saying, if I give every human being this pill, they're going to be cured of every disease or you know, that's an extreme you know example but we've been trying to do that we've been trying to say oh you should drink a gallon of water every day to stay hydrated well that's that might be true for some people other people that might actually be over hydrating them and causing them to flush their fluids for people who maybe work out a lot more often or someone who is a much larger person say the rock or whatever that might not actually be enough water for them. They might actually be dehydrated if they only drank that much water. And it's this imperfection in our observations of this particular sciences that gave rise to statistics. And it allows us to be like, okay, we can look at data sets and we can be like, it appears that for ma the vast majority of people that drinking this much water is a, a sufficient amount of hydration. And then, of course, put an asterisk there and say your results may vary um, and consult with a physician or something like that. Um, and because of this, because of our reliance on statistics for things like health sciences and things like that, we fall victim to some very interesting mathematical paradoxes that are confounding. It, it, it literally kind of breaks your brain a little bit, like most paradoxes do. If you've ever watched Vsauce's videos where 
you know, he presents you with some crazy thing, then you, you are just immediately are like, it's got to be that. There's no way it can't be that. And then he's like, actually, and then just flips it on its head and then makes you realize that your assumptions were wrong. Um, so the Simpsons paradox did the same to me while I was looking it up because I was just, I was confounded. So one of the first examples that I saw on the Wikipedia that was just um, a little mind blowing is um, a look at batting averages. So for anyone who doesn't know what baseball is, um, obviously um, that's our American pastime as we like to call it, where someone with a big wooden stick is hitting a ball um, being thrown at close to 100 miles an hour at them. Um, and so batting average is a statistic where we take the total number of hits over a certain data set and divide it by the number of at-bats in that same data set. So um, what is a data set? This is, this is kind of important for the Simpsons Paradox because it's a, an analysis of separate data sets versus the aggregate total of all the data sets. So um, a data set is you, you're taking data, like let's say you take the entire aggregate data and you're using some kind of variable to pick out a specific amount of that data. So common examples, um, let's say for batting averages, one of the most common examples is looking at a specific season. Um, whenever you're, if you've ever collected baseball cards before, which I've done when I was a kid, and you looked at the back of a batter's um, statistics, it shows his batting average over each season that they've been in the major league baseball or in, in major league baseball, MLB. Um, another example would be, um, and this is more advanced statistics for, um, uh, people who maybe do things like fantasy baseball is they can look at data sets like this is this batter's batting average versus this one particular pitcher or this one particular team. They'll even look at things like batting average in certain stadiums. Um, and so for health sciences, for example, we'll oftentimes take a statistic and we'll split it up into age groups. So we'll say, hey, for infants, this is the statistic. For um, preteens, here's a statistic here. And they'll, that's how they'll break it up. They'll break it up by age group um, or they'll break it up by ethnicity, which is also important because genetics plays a great deal of importance in health science as well. Um, and it's also extremely important in sociology because of um, bias within society towards certain ethnicities versus others in certain countries. And again, that's another way of splitting up the data is saying, here is the mortality rate for this disease in China versus here's the mortality rate of this disease in um, Italy or something like that. And so these are all ways that we can divide the data. This is, this is how we create data sets. And the Simpsons paradox doesn't necessarily say that doing that is wrong, but that you have to be careful with doing this and comparing these data sets in a certain way because it can present some weird um, conclusions um, that you may make because of that and um, the actual aggregate data might say something different. So um, the first example, going back to batting average, is they did a, um, they, they, this, this um, somebody was analyzing batting averages and they were trying to find a, an instance where the Simpsons paradox had occurred in the Major League Baseball. And um, the example, which I'll throw up here in a second, because I want to ask this question first. Um, in the year 1995 and 1996, these are the batting averages for two prominent hitters of the time, Derek Jeter and David Justice. Um, so in 1995, Derek Jeter had a batting average of 250. David Justice had a batting average of 253. So 
based on that number, it's it's a clear thing that David Justice had a better batting average over the course of 1995 over Derek Jeter. So then we go to the next year, 1996. In 1996, Derek Jeter had a batting average of 314. Um, very good batting average, by the way. That's an amazing batting average. Well, David Justice had a batting average of 321. Again, higher. That's about, what, seven points higher. And in the previous year, he was three points higher. So with just that information, just the averages alone, what do you think, who, who do you think has a better batting average over the course of both years, over 95 and 96? Remember, David Justice had a better batting average for both years. Well, this is where the Simpsons paradox just blew my mind. Over the course of both years, Derek Jeter had a batting average of 310. So his total batting average over those two years is 310. And the total bat batting average for David Justice over those two years is 270, 40 points lower. That's insane. Like that's, it, it goes against our, our, what our brain immediately is going to just assume. Anyone looking at just the averages is going to assume, oh yeah, David Justice must have had a better batting average over those two years than Derek Jeter because his single year performance was better in both years as well. Um, and so now I'm going to put up here the actual statistics and it's going to show the total amount of at-bats and the total number of hits for each of these hitters over the course of those two years. And this is where the Simpsons paradox creates this this oddity from the Simpsons paradox is due to sample size. Um, and so what you'll notice is that um, it, it appears that in 1995, Derek Jeter suffered some kind of injury. Um, I was 11 years old then, so I don't personally remember um, what his injury was. But obviously, he probably had some really bad injury that was maybe season ending. Um, and Derek Jeter only had 45 or 48 at bats, whereas David Justice had 411. So David Justice played that whole season from the looks of it. Um, and then the next year, when Derek Jeter was healthy, he had 582 at bats, whereas David Justice only had 140 at bats. And so this is where the paradox is created due to weirdness in the sample sizes. And this is where um, it can be um, inefficient to look at data sets when the sample sizes between the data sets are just far outweighed from one or the other. And um, this, is, this is also not even part of the Simpsons paradox. This is just statistical analysis where um, there's what they like to call margin of error. And margin of error is saying, hey, because we have such a small sample size, um, this is what our estimate is as to what the margin of error. So um, for instance, looking at the batting average of 1995 for Derek Jeter, um, because the sample size is so low, one could conceivably say that his batting average could be you know, anywhere from 200 to 300 if he had played the entire year. Um, because that sample size is so small compared to what a normal sample size for an entire year is. Um, and these are all, this is extremely important and this is how we can um, be tricked. We can be fooled. We can be shown these, these results from individual um, data sets and be led to believe that something is happening when it's really not happening. Um, I'm sure you could just show these statistics to um, any sports analysis person on ESPN or wherever, just show them the batting averages. And I guarantee you the majority of them would, who, who don't like vividly remember those two years would probably say, oh yeah, it looks like David Justice definitely would have had the better batting average over the course of those two years. Um, so yeah, um, again, blew my mind. Um, very interesting. 
So this next example is kind of near and dear to my heart. So um, I know I've said this before, but as many of you know, I have a degree in economics. I won't lie, I didn't get the greatest grades back then when I went to college some 15 years ago. Um, but I really enjoyed studying economics. It was, it was an extremely rewarding, um, from a, an intellectual standpoint, a very rewarding degree that I earned, even if I haven't really been able to use it in real life. Um, so this next anomaly or paradox, as we'd like to call it, is a study that was done where um, they were looking at um, price and demand. So um, for those of you who have a general understanding of economics, um, the idea is that as the price for a product or service or whatever goes up, the demand for that product will go down. Um, it's kind of like um, when there's a shortage of something. So let's say there's a, uh, a shortage of, um, it's usually uh, the, the best example I'm gonna try and come up with is gonna be some kind of a luxury item, um, something that isn't considered a necessity. So um, man, what would be a good uh, luxury item? Let's say jewelry. Uh, let's say there's a shortage because of maybe war or maybe a diamond mine somewhere collapsed and um, suddenly supply has been cut off and the price for diamonds goes skyrocketing. Um, and when that happens, people are, because they have only so much money to spend on these luxury goods, that demand is going to go down. Uh, and this is kind of a just very common, and it depends on the elasticity of the price, um, price and demand curves and the supply demand curves. Um, but generally speaking, for almost all products, that's what happens. As price goes up, demand goes down. Um, well, there was an interesting study that was shown and it was like over the course of 156 weeks. So over the course of basically about three years, um, they were showing that for this particular um, data that they had over that entire three year period, not only did price go up or the average price go up, but so did the demand, which kind of, was confounding it didn't make sense like that this doesn't does not compute that doesn't that isn't how this should work um so what they did is instead they looked at s slices of data um based on time and so when they sliced it up from like week one to 75 they it went right back to the way we would normally think as whenever the price would go up the demand would go down. The same happened with weeks 76 to 125, and then from 126 to 156, the, again, the curve was the way we wanted it to be. We wanted, as price went up, demand went down. So this is the opposite of what we were saying before with the batting averages, which, which data is correct. And it's not saying that either data is incorrect because the data data doesn't lie um, unless somebody's putting the wrong numbers in the data um, which thankfully we have people who will vet data as we like to call it and make sure that the data is actually truthful and isn't just fake made up data so the article that I'm going to link for this picture that where I got this from doesn't necessarily explain it from an economic standpoint. Um, but from my understanding is that it's kind of like looking at this particular data between a microeconomic standpoint and a macroeconomic standpoint. Um, and also looking at it from a short term standpoint and a long term standpoint. So um, in the short term, if a company were to raise the prices of its products, it should expect the demand for their product to go down. Um, and 
what it's saying for the long term is more of a phenomenon um, of global economics, of macroeconomics. So, for instance, um, the what I believe is happening here with this data is inflation. Um, so, as economies, as um, countries grow and wealth has grown, um, it is natural and normal, at least according to the majority of economists that I know and that I've studied, it's normal for inflation to happen as money is being exchanged and it's being exchanged more rapidly, more quickly. Um, and as we have to print more money in order to make sure that there's enough currency to allow the circulation of money. I know there's a lot of controversy around printing money, but as long as there is the circulation of money, it has a multiplicative effect on like on the amount of money. Like um, we can look at the total wealth of the United States. There's we have not printed that much money. Like there isn't. Um, like that much money has been printed in the United States, for instance, as um, if you were to collect up the assets of every American company and every American household together, um, that amount of money doesn't just exist. A lot of it is exists on paper in digital form and because money is being constantly circulated and transferred from buyer to seller, and then that seller becomes a buyer of something else. And then that buyer, again, and it just keeps multiplying down the line. Um, so that just shows that over the course of those three years, inflation went up, which drove prices up. Um, but because the economy was growing, so did demand. So this is where demand and price can go in the same direction and it's just the implications of a growing economy and it's it's weird like that you have to separate short term from long term but this is this is what happens and um something that has to be accounted for in our mathematics when we're trying to understand how market economies work so really interesting. I, I really enjoyed reading that one and being able to personally understand what I believe is happening in that graph. Um, so now that I feel like I've done a decent job of uh, explaining what the Simpsons paradox is, um, I'm going to kind of go all the way back to what made me initially want to um, look this up. So um, there was a couple of different um, news articles that I found, um, all relating to the current pandemic in the, uh, in the world right now. And the first one uh, came out actually from Cornell University. And they, um, there were some statistics coming out very early on during this pandemic back in March, um, where they were comparing cases of um, the coronavirus from China and Italy. So um, they were comparing 44,672 cases from China to the early reports um, from Italy, um, specifically March 9th is the, is the date that they had there for that. And they showed that the case fatality rate was lower in Italy for every single age group. However, when you took the entire population of Italy and the entire population of China and compared the case fatality rates, Italy was higher overall. So similar to the whole batting average thing where, yeah, one person might have a higher average over several years, but you combine all those years together, suddenly it's the opposite. And so this is what happened there. And, um, this paradox was due to, this was a sample size issue, very similar to the Derek Jeter, David Justice um, example from batting averages. Um, demographics between Italy and China are considerably different. There are um, considerably more um, older people in Italy than there are in like in terms of uh, 
the total percentage of the population in comparison to China. Um, and so this disparity in sample sizes and between the different demographics, so these data sets just don't, like the data set for young people in China who are infected versus the data set of Italians in that same age group, they're just so different in terms of the total numbers that were there. And um, it's not to say that you can't draw some decent conclusions from it, but the problem was is that people were looking at those numbers and thinking that the fatality rate in China was so much worse than Italy when it was actually the exact opposite was happening. Um, and then the last one was actually something that came out of the CDC very recently, actually. And I think this is the news report that made me want to look this up. Um, and so this came out of a blog post on uh, UCLA. And um, it was a an analysis of a CDC report that had come out that showed a weird mortality rate between non-Hispanic whites in the, in the United States and Hispanic Latinos in the United States. And they were showing, now these were like the two uh, groups that seemed to have been hit the hardest by, um, by the coronavirus here in the United States. And um, when looking at the data, it looked as though um, white non-Hispanics were being um, had a much higher mortality rate than um, than the Hispanic Latino population, which didn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, you know, from a socioeconomic standpoint, you would think that you know that um, in general here in the United States that non-Hispanic whites that it's it's well known that they are of um, in general, have better health care and things like that. Well, um, they took a look at the actual numbers in there and they had to like aggregate it and they had to try and find a correlation. And it was simple. Um, it was one of those simple things that just no one, you know, um, cared to think about when it first got released, but then it made a lot of sense afterwards is that there are considerably less Hispanics and Latinos that are age 75 and older. Um, for whatever reason, probably, you know, due to, again, saying that Hispanics and Latinos don't have as good of health care here in the United States as whites and non-Latinos, um, the the fact of the matter is, is that most Hispanics and Latinos don't live past 75 very often um and so that age group that 75 plus age group was the hardest hit by this disease and the fact that there are way more white non-latinos that are over the age of 75 than there are hispanic latinos over the age of 75 just showed that that's why this data looked that way that that's um, if you were to just um, look at that 75 plus, yeah, of course that, you know, that's going to look that way. And, and again, this is a sample size problem because there just wasn't enough of a sample size of 75 plus Hispanic Latinos to make this data make sense. And um, unfortunately, this data, I think, um, encouraged some bias among um the white community into thinking that, oh, look at this. This is how, like, you know, all these talks of racism and bias in the United States is unfounded. Well, no, it's just, it actually, when they stepped back and looked at the data, it actually verified the bias because there's just more white people have the, are more likely to live that long because they have access to better health care. Um, so yeah, um, that was, that was really eye opening. Um, I really hope this video was eye opening to y'all as well. Um, I will definitely make sure I do all sorts of fancy, fancy, it's not really that fancy, but editing, putting all my little graphs up here, um, post edit, 
I should get this video out sometime tonight, hopefully. Um, but now it's time for me to uh, get some uh, hydration in my body, go to the gym, do some uh, jogging, uh, try and keep my brain um, from self-sabotaging by, you know, keeping it busy doing these videos and uh, keeping my body um, um, working out and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I really hope you all enjoyed this. And if you have any questions, comments, if you want to, if you disagree with something, please feel free to comment down below. Um, I am not an expert. I don't claim to be an expert on any of this. Um, I will be completely upfront. I graduated college with a 2.8 GPA. I am, I am, I'm not a genius. I am not, um, I've never used my economics degree as in a professional standpoint. So I'm, I'm, I'm not a professional economist. So keep that in mind. Um, and I don't mind being corrected. I don't mind being um, presented different data. Um, I don't mind having my mind changed. So, um, yeah, but just, just all I ask is keep it, um, keep it non-toxic if you can. Um, other things I'm going to, I'm going to try and do more streaming. Um, I'm going to be, uh, um, I'm actually studying. I have the book over there, but I'm studying for the air force officer qualification test. Um, I was thinking of potentially doing a stream where I stream me basically figuring out how to uh, um, streaming myself doing the sample tests and stuff like that in a way that isn't like copyright infringing on the uh, maker of the test book. But um, I thought that would maybe be a fun thing and a way for me to not only have fun streaming because I do enjoy streaming and interacting with my community, but also studying because I need to do more studying. Um, and I know I said that I wouldn't be doing any video game videos on my YouTube anymore. I probably lied about that. I'll be honest. I've been really getting back into, uh, playing games like Overwatch. And, uh, I think it would be kind of fun for me to record videos of, um, or at least maybe stream a video of me doing a um, a VOD review of one of my competitive games where I maybe analyze things I did right and things I did wrong. Um, and then posting that VOD review from Twitch over to YouTube. So, um, yeah, so some fun things I, I want to try and do. Um, I've got kind of a copious amount of free time. Um, and it's just a matter of, uh, breaking through those mental barriers that I think a lot of us are, are currently feeling in these trying times and these, um, just it's, there's no other way to say it. It's just, it's difficult right now, guys. So, um, keep that in mind. It's valid to, to feel that way. It's, um, no one is living a perfect life right now. Um, and, uh, try not to compare yourself to other people. Just, fight your own fight and uh, um, don't mind those people who seem to think they have it all put together on, on their Facebook or Twitter or whatever, because chances are they're fighting some fight that they're just not willing to post on Twitter. So um, my little mental health tip of the day there. So anyway, y'all, I hope you uh, have a wonderful, wonderful weekend and I'll catch you guys on the next Apple looks stuff up. Have a good one. Bye.